Chris, Thank always you. an absolute pleasure, mate. Let's talk about the Women's Rugby World Cup. So many questions to ask you, and we wanted to go around the world and go to all of our rugby kind of based countries where the sport does have a foothold and find out what kind of interest it has. Over here in New Zealand, I've got to be honest, uh, the, 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 the hype machine is in, is in full train. Um, the mass media here are just falling over themselves in their sycophantic praise, you know, which is a real shame because I think it actually belittles the tournament and belittles and patronises the athletes. You know, they want to be treated like they are an equal athlete, and you can't do that if you're continually fawning and fetting over them. But first and foremost, the kind of coverage that it's getting up at your place. Uh, pretty good. You know, I was actually at the, the first Women's World Cup final in 1991. There were sort of 3,000 people in Cardiff in, in the small stadium there. And, uh, you know, it, it, what did that had no interest whatsoever outside the small number of people who were, who were actually there. Uh, but uh, there was an ITV documentary. ITV, like uh, the rug, Men's Rugby World Cup, they have the rights to, uh, to show this. So it's getting, uh, it's getting prime time coverage. Of course, the problem is the kickoff times. You know, England, France will be 8 a.m., but if you want to see Wales, New Zealand, that's 3.15 in the morning. So this is a this is a serious drawback in terms of numbers. But, you know, there's a big documentary ITV put on prime time before the tournament started. And the way that the uh, the women's England women's team in particular have gone 26 tests uh, undefeated has got a lot of publicity. And, you know, the Telegraph, uh, Daily Telegraph in particular, has given them uh, an awful lot of coverage. The other papers are also, you know, showing it you know due attention because it is a world cup and of course it'd be getting more attention if they actually win the thing all right also a lot of figures are coming out about how much money the england women are actually going to get paid let's get on to that in a second in terms of who can win this is it still massive favoritism for your lot up there because as the hype train builds here in new zealand we kind of i just i hope we're not going to paint ourselves this false dawn that all of a sudden after what we saw last year that the black Ferns have completely turned it around because we haven't played anyone up to the level of france or england since then yeah this is where uh, the england france game is so interesting because france has been getting better and better and it's going to be a classic uh, England for massive pack against the French flair. And, you know, it's women or men, it's exactly the same idea. And, you know, they've been playing against each other so regularly that they've actually played themselves into a really good competitive match. And, uh, you know, we shouldn't have, uh, you know, the 80-point type results. It should be a really good match, which which should set a standard for the rest of the tournament, I hope. Uh, England also are trying to copy the, the men in that um, Sarah Hunter uh, decided to indulge in some Eddie Jones school of trash talk by saying it's New Zealand's World Cup to lose. Uh, yeah, a great one, Sarah. Yeah, as if anybody is going to sort of take that uh, with anything other than a massive pinch of salt. This is this is England's World Cup to win. They are fully professional, though. You know, there are seven in the squad who aren't full time, but that's out of their choice. The rest are, are on contracts with the RFU, ranging from. Twenty-five thousand pounds to thirty-one thousand pounds. So they've, you know, they've given up their jobs uh, to to play rugby, and really, it, it's only England, New Zealand, and France who can sort of put that sort of money behind the women's game. That's why you can't really look further than those three. Although Canada, will, will, as always, will give it a bit of a go. The real disappointment and. You know, what a big disappointment after the men and women were given the the World Cups uh, looming ahead in America. Both the American men who are trying desperately not to qualify for France and now the women have gone and suffered you know, a, a big defeat in their opening game. It's it's not great for a country, you know, America, which had put so much stock in their development of women's rugby. If they can't get it right, we really are in trouble. Chris Jones, Times, Sunday Times, Rugby Pass. He's been covering rugby and tennis for us for a couple of decades now. You've got Ireland, Wales, Scotland, England and France all here to play. So I would expect, you know, a pretty good kind of coverage up your place, given the fact that rugby is really popular. And also you've got, all, we've got the five nations, six nations teams, or Italy there as well, forgive me, um, all of them playing. Absolutely. And, you know, that Wales-Scotland game, although it may be a, a great example of, of why goal kicking should, yeah, should, yeah, actually they should spend much more, much more time kicking the goal due to the dreadful percentages. And even England were operating at 50%. The fact it was that final kick to win the game for Wales, that got a lot of attention. And it, it, sometimes it takes something, you know, as oblique as that just to catch the attention of of 
people who say, oh, I'm not going to bother watching that. You know, oh, did you see that match? That, that last minute kick, Wales won. Oh, crikey, I'll catch up with that. And that's the sort of thing that's building up here. But for, in England, it's different to Ireland, Scotland and Wales. In England, there really is a massive expectation that this team, as I said, 26 tests unbeaten, is going to win the World Cup. And they've got some players like Sarah Hunter who who are recognisable now. Now, that wasn't the case even three or four years ago, you know. They've got an awful lot more uh, publicity. The Daily Telegraph now have a women's uh, sports editor, uh, Sarah Mockford, who was just stopped uh, in her previous role as editor of Rugby World magazine. So that gives you some idea of the sort of calibre of person now getting involved in women's sport in, in one of the major papers. And that, that's honestly it's great to see because rugby needs to do that in terms of the women's side. Because the Lionesses, the women's England football team, have just beaten the USA here two mm, one. Mm. That got lots of that lots of attention, and so what that that is what those girls are up against. Don't put it up against the men's team, and it will be difficult because when we get to the the, the final with you guys, November the twelfth, is the same day Eddie Jones's England team are playing Japan. Your lot are playing Scotland the next day, so there's going to be huge attention on those matches up here in the Northern Hemisphere in terms of space and acreage on the newspapers but there will be a lot of attention if england are in that final hopefully against new zealand chris how do you how do you maintain the kind of audiences i know that the european championships england women won and they got a packed out house at wembley and then of course at ninety thousand or something again for the <coughs> u.s uh women's team uh, lots of coverage because of that world champions and everything else how do you kind of maintain that momentum how because you know what i i think the sport needs and just my opinion is that it needs to take off publicity wise up the Northern Hemisphere, because that's where the bulk of the audience is. It's fine getting a good audience down here in New Zealand, but that's not the world. What we need is we need it to be able to grasp, get a good foothold up there. Yeah, well, that's where the yeah the, the Premiership uh, women's uh, competition up here is so important, because there are players coming in from uh, France, coming in from uh, Australia, and also uh, you know Canada and USA are coming, because you can actually earn some money playing club rugby, uh, here in England, it is embryonic, but it, it, it's got going, and it, it, it's now starting to warrant coverage uh, on TV as well. Not not huge channel uh, impact, but it is you know, it's small steps. And this is where I think the the women's side of the game has, has been more has been clever this time rather than previous launches. They are happy to take small steps, and those small steps are even more important at the moment when they see the complete basket case of a scenario. On the men's side, you know, with Worcester Rugby Club in in administration and one of the great names, Wasps, likely to go into administration next week unless they find two million pounds to pay the tax man. So, yeah, it's it's important up here to have a, a viable league. And I think they understand that. So they're not paying stupid money uh, to a lot of players. They have some professional players, but a lot of them are part time. And that's the way it's got to be built. It's just how they did it with the football. The other line there says didn't suddenly become fully professional and, and have a successful league and, and, and a match between Arsenal and Tottenham in the women's side attracting 40,000 people. And that's a direct result of the knock-on effect of the Lionesses being successful at international level. Now, what they're hoping, of course, is that the England Red Roses win the World Cup with, in New Zealand and therefore their interest will bring more than just a couple of hundred people to the matches on a club Saturday. And that's that's going to be the key factor here. Can they replicate what the football girls have done? All right, Chris Jones, Time Sunday Times Rugby Pass with us. Ring the cash registers, ladies and gentlemen. I tell you what, the banks won't be able to hold the amount of loot that the women are going to deposit after they, well, hopefully, I mean, we'll say that ours win it. I don't know what they're going to get paid, but yours, the cash is what? The cash is, if they win the World Cup, £15,000 each. And that's on top of the two and a half thousand pounds per game they're going to get up to the semi final. Get to the final, another ten thousand pounds. Well done, girls. Giving a grand total of around thirty seven and a half thousand pounds. That's not bad money, is it's it? It's not bad, but, but compared to the men, play, compared to the men, member, though, this is where the sexism comes in, the rampantness of the male know, patriarchy comes in, Chris. Well, 2019 Rugby World Cup, where. Uh, Remind me again who England beat in the semi-final. Well, well didn't beat us, final. Chris. Didn't beat us. Thrashed us and pantsed us. I saw you in Tokyo. I, I, I laid down in front of you and said, walk <laughs> no, over me. I will I be know. the coat well, over your they puddle. Had managed to t- if they'd managed to turn up on that final day against South Africa rather than gone missing, 
and won the World Cup, they would have walked away each £220,000 richer because they were getting £13,000 a match. Uh, and, that, and with the bonuses, the RFU, who didn't have any money, so I think they breathed a huge sigh of relief when they didn't win the World Cup, had committed themselves to a, uh, a fund of £7 million that was going to be spread amongst the players. I suppose that would have been £6 million to Eddie and a million to the players, but it was £7 million. So there is a massive disparity, but I think the girls understand that. And you know what? If you're earning... £31,000 on a pro contract with the RFU and you're going to walk away with another £37,500, suddenly the energy crisis, the hike in interest rates and the fact the, uh, the Europe's going to the dogs is slightly lessened. 